Welcome to part two, where we talk about Union Square, Madison Square, Abington, Greeley, and Worth Square. Union Square is a historic intersection and surrounding neighborhood located where Broadway and the former Bowery Road, now 4th Avenue, came together in the early 19th century. Its name denotes that here was the union of two principal thoroughfares of the island and not named for organized labor at all. And I always thought it was about organized labor. The area around present-day Union Square was originally farmland. The northwestern corner of the park contained one acre of land owned by the Manhattan Bank, which supposedly was a refuge for businesses during New York City's yellow fever epidemics. By act of the state legislature, this former Potter's Field, another public cemetery, became a public commons for the city at first named Union Place. Another public cemetery we trampled all over every day. In 1831, at a time when the city was quickly expanding and the surrounding area was still sparsely developed, Samuel Ruggles, one of the founders of the Bank of Commerce and the developer of Gramercy Park to the Northeast, convinced the city to rename the area as Union Square. A fountain was built in the center to receive water from the Croton Aqueduct, completed in 1842. At first, the square, the last public space that functioned as the entrance to New York City, was largely residential. After the Civil War, the neighborhood became largely commercial and the square began to lose social cachet at the turn of the 20th century, with many of the old mansions being demolished. Tiffany and Company, which had moved to the square from Bowery and Broome in 1807, left its premises on 15th Street to move uptown to 37th Street in 1905. The Silversmiths Gorham and Company moved up and away from 19th Street in 1906. The Rialto, New York City's first commercial theater district, was located in and around Union Square beginning in the 1870s. It was named after Venice's Rialto, a commercial district. The first facility to open within the Union Square Rialto was the Academy of Music, which opened at Irving Place in 1854. Imagine that, Irving Place and Music. The theater district gradually relocated northward into less expensive and undeveloped uptown neighborhoods and eventually into the current theater district. Before the Civil War, Theaters in New York City were primarily located along Broadway and the Bowery up to 14th Street, with those on Broadway appealing more to the middle and upper classes and the Bowery theaters attracting immigrant audiences like clerks and working classes. If you ever read uh, Low Life by uh, Luke Sante, he talks extensively about that, and the, uh, the immigrants and working classes were referred to as mechanics. Much of it was ethnic theater. After the war, the development of the Ladies Mile Shopping District along 5th Avenue and 6th Avenues above 14th Street had the effect of pulling the playhouses uptown. At the same time, the transition from stock companies in which a resident acting company was based around a star or an impresario to a combination system in which productions were put together on a one-time basis to mount a specific play, sort of like venture capital, expanded the amount of outside support needed to service the theatrical industry. Thus, suppliers of props, costumes, wigs, scenery, and other theatrical necessities grew up around the new theaters. The new system also needed an organized way to engage actors for these one-off productions. So, talent brokers and theatrical agents sprang up, as did theatrical boarding houses, stage photographers, publicity agencies, theatrical printers, and play publishers. Along with the hotels and restaurants which serviced the theatergoers and shoppers of the area, the Union Square Rialto was, by the end of the century, a thriving theatrical neighborhood, which would soon nonetheless migrate uptown to what had become known as Broadway, as the Rialto had been subsumed into the more vice-oriented Tenderloin Entertainment District. During this era, many of the older homes on the square were converted into tenements for immigrants and industrial workers. Numerous artists relocated into the attics of the remaining mansions along 14th Street where they had their studios. The 1939 WPA Guide to New York City said that by the 1920s, south side of 14th Street became virtually an extension of Greenwich Village. Further, real estate values around Union Square had declined by the 1920s with burlesque houses, shooting galleries, and shoddy businesses lining the square. 
Throughout the decades, most buildings on the eastern part of the square were purchased by department stores S. Klein and Orbex. Union Square was named a National Historic Landmark in 1997, primarily to honor it as the site of the first Labor Day parade. 1997? Really? Just that recently? Following the September 11th attacks in 2001, Union Square became a primary public gathering point for mourners. People created spontaneous candle and photograph memorials in the park and vigils were held to honor the victims. At the time, non-emergency vehicles were temporarily banned and pedestrian travel was restricted in Lower Manhattan below 14th Street. The square's tradition as a meeting place in times of upheaval was also a factor in its being used as a vigil gathering site. How about that? Union Square is noted for its impressive equestrian statue of U.S. President George Washington, modeled by Henry Kirk Brown and unveiled in 1856. Located at the south end of the park, it was the first public sculpture erected in New York City since the equestrian statue of George III in 1770 and the first American equestrian sculpture cast in bronze. The Marquis de Lafayette at Union Square East and 16th Street was modeled by Frederick Auguste Bartoldi, the guy who designed the Statue of Liberty, and dedicated in 1876, the 100th anniversary of U.S. independence. The statue of Abraham Lincoln, also modeled by Henry Kirk Brown, is located at the north end of the park. A statue of Mahatma Gandhi in the southwest corner of the park was added in 1986. The Union Square Drinking Fountain, near Union Square West, another fountain, was also known as the James Fountain. It is a temperance fountain with the figure of Charity who empties her jug of water aided by a child. It was donated by Daniel Willis James and sculpted by Adolf Dondorf. The Charles F. Murphy Memorial Flagpole, also known as the Independence Flagstaff, was cast in 1926 and dedicated in 1930 to mark the 150th anniversary of U.S. Independence. It is located in the center of the park. In 1976, the Council on the Environment of New York City, now GROW NYC, established the Green Market Program, which provided regional small family farmers with opportunities to sell their fruits, vegetables, and other farm products at open-air markets in the city. There were originally seven farmers at the first Green Market, and their selection was sold out by noon. Today, the Union Square Green Market, the best known of the markets, is held Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays between 8 and 6 p.m. year-round. During peak seasons, the Green Market serves more than 250,000 customers per week. Union Square is a popular meeting place, given its central location in Manhattan and many nearby subway routes. The park has historically been the start or end point for many political demonstrations. In April 1861, soon after the fall of Fort Sumter, it was the site of a patriotic rally of perhaps a quarter of a million people that is thought to have been the largest public gathering in North America up to that time. In the summer of 1864, the north side of the square was the site of the Metropolitan Fair. Union Square has been a frequent gathering point for radicals of all stripes to make speeches or demonstrate. In 1865, the recently formed Irish Republican Fenian Brotherhood came out publicly and rented Dr. John Moffat's Brownstone Row House at 32 East 17th Street next to the Everett House Hotel facing the north side of the square for the capital of the government in exile they declared. On September 5, 1882, the first Labor Day celebration, a crowd of at least 10,000 workers paraded up Broadway and filed past the reviewing stand at Union Square. On March 28, 1908, an anarchist set off a bomb in Union Square, which only killed himself and another man. On August 21, 1893, Emma Goldman took the stage at Union Square to make her free bread speech to a crowd of overworked garment workers. She also addressed a crowd on May 20th, 1916, on the need for free access to birth control, which was banned by the Comstock laws. Union Square has been used as a platform to raise awareness about the Black Lives Matter movement. The Square Shopping District saw strikes in the S. Klein and Orbach department stores in 1934. The Devil and Miss Jones, directed by Sam Wood, known from A Night at the Opera and A Day at the Races, starring the Marx Brothers, by the way, uh, the movie was with Gene Arthur, Bob Cummings, Charles Coburn, Edmund Gwen, and Spring Byington, and it was about that very hot issue at the time. 
white collar workers were among the worst paid in the city in the Great Depression, with union memberships being highly discouraged by store managers and often seen as fireable offenses. These strikes often involved acts of disobedience by the workers, as many of them did not want to lose their jobs. This period saw Union Square as a gathering point for many of the city's socialist and communist groups. The centennial of Union Square was seen as a thinly veiled effort to displace those elements with the draping of the square with flags and police demonstrations of anti-protester drills. The Villager, a local newspaper, reported in 2013 that most of the street chess players at Washington Square Park, where Bobby Fischer had played, had moved their games to Union Square because the latter had more foot traffic. Street chess players play fast chess with passers-by for 3 to $5 a game, with time controls of five minutes on each side being the most common. I never knew that. The Union Square Partnership provides a free public Wi-Fi network in Union Square. There are many bars and restaurants on the periphery of the square, and the surrounding streets have some of the city's most renowned and expensive restaurants. I live near Madison Square Park, so this is the most interesting to me because it's closest to my life. Madison Square is probably best known around the world for providing the name of Madison Square Garden, a sports arena, and a successor, which were located just northeast of the park for 47 years until 1925. The current Madison Square Garden, the fourth such building, is not in the area. Notable buildings around Madison Square include the Flatiron Building, the Toy Center, the New York Life Building, the New York Merchandise Mart, the Appellate Division Courthouse, and MetLife Tower, and one Madison Park, a 50-story condominium tower. And 11 Madison Park is one of the best restaurants in the USA and the world. The area in which Madison Square is now had been a swampy hunting ground. It was a potter's field in the 1700s. Again, another public cemetery. In 1839, a farmhouse located in what is now 5th Avenue and 23rd Street was turned into a roadhouse under the direction of William Corporal Thompson, who later renamed it Madison Cottage after the former president. The roadhouse was the last stop for people traveling northward out of the city. Isn't that something? Or the first stop for those arriving from the north. Visitors were encouraged not to sleep more than five to a bed. Though Madison Cottage itself was raised in 1852, it ultimately gave rise to the names of the adjacent Madison Avenue and Park, which are therefore only indirectly named after President James Madison. Initially, the houses around the park were narrow, crowded, and dark brownstone row houses with small rooms easily subject to becoming clustered. Today, the only remnant of these brownstones is a single building at 14 East 23rd Street. Despite this beginning throughout the 1870s, the neighborhood became an aristocratic one of brownstone row houses and mansions where the elite of the city lived. Theodore Roosevelt, Edith Wharton, and Winston Churchill's mother, Jenny Jerome, were all born here. Madison Cottage was torn down in 1852 to make way for Franconi's Hippodrome, which lasted only two years. It was an area which seated 10,000 customers and presented chariot races on its 40-foot-wide track, as well as exotic animals such as elephants and camels. A money loser, it would soon be raised so that the Fifth Avenue Hotel could be built on the site. In 1853, plans had been made to build the Crystal Palace there but strong public opposition and protests caused the palace to be relocated by the Board of Aldermen to the site of present-day Bryant Park. The roots of the New York Knickerbocker Baseball Club, one of the first professional baseball teams, are in Madison Square. Amateur players began in 1842 to use a vacant sandlot at 27th and Madison for their games, and eventually, Alexander Cartwright suggested they draw up rules for the game and start a professional club. When they lost their sandlot to development, they moved across the Hudson River to Hoboken, New Jersey, where they played their first game in 1846. During the 1863 New York City draft riots, again, more riots, 10,000 federal troops were brought in to control the rioters encamped in Madison Square and Washington Square. The Fifth Avenue Hotel, a luxury hotel built by developer Amos Eno, initially known as Eno's Folly because it was so far away from the hotel district, stood on the west side of Madison Square from 1859 to 1908. It was the first hotel in the nation with elevators, which were steam-powered and known as the Vertical Railroad, 
which had the effect of making the upper floors more desirable as they no longer had to be reached by climbing stairs. It had fireplaces in every bedroom, private bathrooms, and public rooms which saw many elegant events. Notable visitors to the hotel included Mark Twain, Swedish singer Jenny Lind, railroad tycoon Jay Gould, financier Big Jim Fisk, the Prince of Wales, and U.S. Presidents James Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, Grover Cleveland, Benjamin Harrison, and William McKinley. It's funny, three of those presidents were assassinated. The hotel, which was noted for its Amen Corner, where political boss Thomas Collier Platt held court in the 1890s, was closed and demolished in 1908. It is reported that patrons of the hotel's bar spent $7,000 on drinks on its last day of operation. A plaque on the Toy Center, the building currently on the site, commemorates the hotel. In the early part of the 20th century, the neighborhood around Madison Square became known for the number of clothing manufacturers who had set up shop there, as well as industrial concerns such as the Lionel Train Company, which had its headquarters there, where it displayed its first model train layout. Lionel's competitor, the A.C. Gilbert Company, set up its New York Hall of Science in the neighborhood as well. In 1941, on 25th Street across from Worth Square, in a building that still stands, addressed as 202 Fifth Avenue, Gilbert also displayed its train layouts. Lionel eventually bought up Gilbert in 1967. The toy industry gravitated to the area during World War I with a number of toy manufacturers having locations at 200 Fifth Avenue, which eventually became the International Toy Center. In 1967, the center expanded up Broadway to an additional building at 1107 Broadway, and the two were connected by a pedestrian bridge. The Toy Center was, for many years, the site of the annual Toy Fair until 2005 when the center closed. Some of the major manufacturers, such as Mattel and Hasbro, expanded out of the Toy Center building into their own headquarters nearby, Mattel on West 23rd Street and Hasbro on 6th Avenue. And I must say, I greatly enjoyed the Toy Fair. They had a giant toy wagon, a promotional prop or tool. It was installed in the park and people could walk around and stare at it. The nicest thing in the park at the time, for sure. The thing was huge. I think it was a radio flyer. The exhibits were really cool, too. They had tents full of people going in and out of seeing all these different toys inside the park. And outside, on 23rd Street, one of the coolest things was a trailer full of Hot Wheels on motorized tracks. Boss, man. Echoes of that remain at the Lego store at 205th Avenue, a tourist must. It is currently the home of Italy. With the success of the 5th Avenue Hotel, which could house 800 guests, other grand hotels such as the Hoffman House, the Brunswick House, and the Victoria opened in the surrounding area, as did entertainment venues such as the Madison Square Theater and Chickering Hall. Upscale restaurants such as Delmonico's and high-end retail shops opened along 5th Avenue and Broadway. In addition, nearby exclusive private clubs such as the Union... Athenium and Lotos clubs began to open, but also concert saloons like the Louvre, full of waitresses in provocative short skirts who served drinks and provided music hall entertainment for the customers, began to appear as well. The waitresses were often willing to take the male customers upstairs to private rooms or to one of the many nearby brothels, which had also started to pop up. More vice. So we got riots. We got vice. We have hotels and we have public cemeteries. At the western side of Madison Square Park, on an island bordered by Broadway, 5th Avenue, and 25th Street, stands an obelisk designed by James Goodwin Batterson, which was erected in 1857 over the tomb of General William Jenkins Worth, who served in the Seminole Wars and the Mexican War, and for whom Fort Worth, Texas was named, as well as Worth Street in Lower Manhattan. The city's parks department designated the area immediately around the monument as a parklet called General Worth Square. If you have ever eaten at Madison Square Eats, one of the urban space outdoor food festivals, you have eaten right near the tomb of General Worth. I've walked past it for decades and learned about him a long time ago. I'll tell you what. I also have to mention both Abington and Greeley Square. Abington Square Park is located in Manhattan, bordered by 8th Avenue, Bank Street, Hudson, and West 12th. Abington Square is one of New York City's oldest parks and at a quarter acre, one of its smallest. It is maintained by the Abington Square Park Conservancy, a community-based association in cooperation with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. New York City first acquired the land on which the park resides on April 22, 1831, and it was enclosed with a cast-iron fence in 1836. 
in the 1880s, an effort was initiated by Mayor Abram Stevens Hewitt to expand public access to parks. The square was part of a 300-acre estate purchased by Sir Peter Warren in 1740. Abingdon Square was named for a prominent 18th century area resident, Charlotte Warren, who married Englishman Willoughby Bertie, the fourth Earl of Abingdon, and received the land as a wedding gift from her father. Although most explicitly British names in Manhattan were altered after the Revolutionary War, Abingdon Square retained its name due to the well-known patriotic sympathies of Charlotte and the Earl. Greeley Square lies between 32nd and 33rd Street between Broadway and 6th Avenue and is taken up almost entirely by a triangular park. It is named after Horace Greeley, who was the publisher of the New York Tribune, the Herald's rival newspaper. The expression, go west, young man, is a phrase, the origin of which is often accredited to the American author and newspaper editor Horace Greeley concerning America's expansion westward related to the then popular concept of manifest destiny. No one has yet proven who first used this phrase in print. Now, back to Madison Square Park. A redesign brought in the sculptures that now reside in the park. One notable sculpture is the seated bronze portrait of Secretary of State William H. Seward by Randolph Rogers, which sits at the southwest entrance of the park. Seward, who is best remembered for purchasing Alaska, Seward's Folly, from Russia, was the first New Yorker to have a monument erected in his honor. Other statues in the park depict Roscoe Conkling, who served in Congress in both the House and the Senate, and who collapsed at that spot in the park while walking home from his office during the blizzard of 1888 and died five weeks later after refusing to pay a cab $50 for the ride. Chester Arthur, 21st President of the United States, and David Farragut, who was supposed to have said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, in the Battle of Mobile Bay during the Civil War, are also there. Along the south edge of the park is the Eternal Light Flagstaff, dedicated on Armistice Day in 1923 and restored in 2002, which commemorates the return of American soldiers and sailors from World War I. Madison Square continued to be a focus of public activities for the city. In the 1870s, Amos Enos Cumberland apartment building, which stood on 22nd Street where the Flatiron Building would eventually be built, had four stories of its back wall facing Madison Square, so Eno rented it out to advertisers, including the New York Times, who installed a sign made of electric lights. Eno later put a canvas screen on the wall and projected images on it from a magic lantern on top of one of the smaller buildings on the lot, presenting both advertisements and interesting pictures in alternation. Both the Times and the New York Tribune began using the screen for news bulletins and on election nights, crowds of tens of thousands of people would gather in Madison Square waiting for the latest results. Madison Square was the site of some of the first electric street lighting in the city. In 1879, the city authorized the Brush Electric Light Company to build a generating station on 25th Street powered by steam that provided electricity for a series of arc lights that were installed on Broadway between Union Square and Madison Square. The lights were illuminated on December 20, 1880. A year later, 160-foot sun towers with clusters of arc lights were erected in Union and Madison Squares. In 1876, a large celebration was held in Madison Square to honor the centennial of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Then, from 1876 to 1882, the torch and arm of the Statue of Liberty were exhibited in the park in an effort to raise funds for building the pedestal of the statue. The building that became the first Madison Square Garden at 26th Street and Madison Avenue was built in 1832 as the passenger depot of the New York Harlem Railroad and was later used by the New York and New Haven Railroad as well. Both were owned by Cornelius Vanderbilt. When the depot moved uptown in 1871 to Grand Central, the building stood vacant until 1873 when it was leased to P.T. Barnum, who converted it into the open-air Monster Classical and Geological Hippodrome for circus performances, exhibits transferred from Barnum's American Museum, as well as cowboys and Indians, tattooed men, bicycle races, dog shows, and horse shows. In 1875, the garden was sublet to noted band leader Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore, who filled the space with trees, flowers, and fountains, and named it Gilmore's Concert Garden. Gilmore's band of 100 musicians played 150 consecutive concerts there and continued to perform in the garden for two years. After he gave up his sublet, others presented marathon races, temperance and revival meetings, balls, the first Westminster Kennel Club dog show, as well as boxing exhibitions or illustrated lectures since competitive boxing matches were illegal at the time. 
It was finally renamed Madison Square Garden in 1879 by William Kissam Vanderbilt, the son of Commodore Vanderbilt, who continued to present sporting events, the National Horse Show, and more boxing, including bouts by John L. Sullivan that drew huge crowds. Vanderbilt eventually sold what Harper's Weekly called his patched-up, grimy, drafty, combustible old shell to a syndicate that included J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, James Stillman, and W.W. W. Astor. The building that replaced it was a bow arch structure designed by the noted architect Stanford White. White kept an apartment in the building and was shot dead in the garden's rooftop restaurant by millionaire Henry K. Thaw over an affair White had with Thaw's wife, the well-known actress Evelyn Nesbitt, who White seduced when she was 16. The resulting sensational press coverage of the scandal caused Thaw's trial to be one of the first trials of the century. The Garden hosted the annual French Ball, both the Barnum and Ringling Brothers circuses, orchestral performances, light operas and romantic comedies, and the 1924 Democratic National Convention, which nominated John W. Davis after 103 ballots, but it was never a financial success. It was torn down soon after, and the venue moved uptown. In 1986, ground was broken on what was to become a full-scale restoration of the park. Phase one of the project involving the north end of the park and Worth Square was completed in 1988 and included the addition of a playground on the northeast corner. I have seen many, many rats crawl all over that playground. Phase two was to have begun in 1987 but never got started, leaving the south end of the park unrestored for 11 years. One amenity added to the park in July 2004 is the Shake Shack a popular permanent stand that serves hamburgers, hot dogs, shakes, and other similar food, as well as wine. It is a tourist must, along with the Lego store at 205th Avenue. There are crazy long lines all day and all night. Every day it is open. We have often stopped in the park after dining in Curry Hill, the Rose Hill adjacent stretch of Indian restaurants on Lexington Avenue in the 20s and have taken in some of the public art installations, which have been wonderful. Everything from mirrored pathways to giant head sculptures to woven maze-like assemblages to orbs, it's a really good use of public space. And we just so happened to have rested our bones in the park one evening at the height of Pokemon Go when we were surrounded by large groups of mostly kids with adult chaperones having the time of their lives chasing after them. The spice of life. So, among a litany of other things, vice, riots, public protests, public cemeteries, hotels, statuary, and fountains are part and parcel of New York's amazing history. Thanks for listening. See you next time. And as the kitties say, peace out. (laughs) 